Okay, so we'll talk about graph um, searching algorithms. And I guess just to get started, maybe this is a little bit of a refresher, but if you want to represent a graph in computer memory, let's say, so for example, a graph is a series of vertices. Here's a graph with five vertices. They have names, which could be numbers, or we can make up names for them. They don't have to be numbers. But this is, you know, vertex one, two, three, four, and five. And this graph is basically saying there's an edge between one and two, so one and two are connected. There's no edge between one and four, so one and four are not connected. So what we want to be able to do to write computer programs that answer questions about graphs, what we'd like to do is we'd like to be able to somehow represent this picture in computer memory. And one popular way to do that is to use an adjacency list. So basically, we make a vector of all our nodes, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, and then we build a linked list. We use the data structure linked list and add a link for every vertex that we are connected to. So if 1 is connected to 2 and 5, then we would expect to see in the linked list for 1, we would expect to see a link for 2 and for 5. And this graph is... Um, this graph is a non-directed graph. So if you remember from your graph theory, a graph can have, the edges can have an orientation to them or not. In this case, this graph over here is what's called a directed graph. So this is basically saying 1 is connected to 2, but 2 is not connected to 1. And in the real world, this could be kind of like a one-way street, and this is a two-way street. You can get from 1 to 2, and you can get from 2 to 1. So in a non-directed graph, uh, we have to somehow capture the fact that 1 is connected to 2 and 1 is connected to 5, but 1 is not connected to anything else. And one of the simple data structures we know is a linked list. We need something that we can obviously add stuff to. So a linked list we can add as we're reading in the graph. We could say 1 is connected to 2. And then if we decide 1 is also connected to 5, we just add a link onto the end of the list. There's no order to this, so the operation of adding something to the end of the linked list is just a constant time operation. Adding to the end of an unordered linked list is a constant time operation. So then we read 2, and we say 2 is connected to 1, 5, 4, and 3. Actually, 2 is connected to all of them. There, its linked list will be every other vertex with the exception of 2. So this is one way to do it. This is the adjacency list way. Um, and just, for example, with the directed graph, we would say 1 can connect to 2 and 1 can connect to 4. So the linked list for 1 would have 2 and 4 on it. And then, for example, 3 can connect to 6. And also, a, a vertex can connect to itself. This might show up in questions we want to do later on. So 3 can connect to 6 and 3 can connect to 5, so the linked list for 3 would have a 5 and a 6 on it, and again, no order is implied here. So I'm just going to put this as 6 and 5 to show there's no order implied. 6 can only connect to itself, so the linked list for 6 is 6. Might look a little strange, but a, a vertex can connect to itself. It's implied that in an undirected graph, you can get from any node to itself by just sitting there. Okay, now, uh, probably a more, if I was to ask you, how would you represent a graph in computer memory, what would be a, what would you come up with? Probably a more brute force method, right? Um, you could, another way to do this would be an adjacency matrix. So an adjacency matrix is, again, we have to somehow record in computer memory the picture of the graph. We have to somehow take this picture and record it somewhere. And then if we want to answer questions like, you know, some question you might ask is like, I want to get from this node to this node, um, is it possible, yes or no? Or what's the shortest way or the quickest way to get there? So if you're doing like GPS and you're trying to get from your house to the college, and these are all streets that connect your house to the college, you want to find what's the quickest way. Well, one great question might be, what's the fastest way to get from one point to another? But somehow we have to represent the picture in computer storage so then we can run our algorithm on it. 
So another way to do it would be to have a matrix of Booleans and just turn a 1 on if they're connected and a 0 if they're not connected. So this is, uh, this would be a, since we have five vertices, we would have a 5 by 5 matrix and we'd be saying 1 is connected to 2 and therefore 2 is connected to 1 because this is an undirected case. So uh, 2 is connected to 3 and therefore 3 is connected to 2. So actually if you went down this diagonal, this should be symmetric. Each side of the diagonal should match each other, right? If 1 is connected to 2, 2 is connected to 1. If 2 is connected to 3, 3 is connected to 2. If 4 is connected to 2, then 2 is connected to 4. If 5 is connected to 1, then 1 is connected to 5. So these should be symmetrical. If you drew a line down here, like above my arm and below my arm, should match exactly. That wouldn't be the case here. So, oh, one other thing. Half of this matrix is a complete waste of space because it's just a repeat of the other half, right? We could almost get rid of it. We could pick one side and get rid of it if we wanted to save storage. But when we go and declare two-dimensional arrays, we can't declare them and say, get rid of half the storage. So we just have to kind of live with the fact that um, we'll have duplicate information. In the directed case, it's actually good to have both sides because one might be connected to two, but two is not connected to one. So this one here says one is connected to two, but two is not connected to one. So this is where the directed case is where we use up the entire, we make use of the entire two-dimensional array. Okay, so intuition probably tells you you could represent a graph with an adjacency matrix, but some of the algorithms we use will use might work faster if we use the uh, adjacency list. Okay, so one uh, popular question is, when you have a graph, can you find something in it? So let's say, for example, we started with a graph like this, and let's say, let's say this was our graph and we decided that one node's going to always be our root. That's where all our algorithms will start from. So let's say node one was the root, and we wanted to know, can I get from one to six? Well, I'd have to run some kind of an algorithm where I go like, maybe I'll look at this one first, and then if that's not a six, what should I do next? Should I, should I go back to here and look here? And then if that's no good, then look at the, so I, I'm kind of considering this node and this node a child of this one. So maybe I could check the children first, and if it's not any of the children, then check the grandchildren, and then the great-grandchildren. Or we could take one and just go as long as the path can go until we've exhausted ourselves, then go back to the beginning and then pick another child and go down that tree. So there's probably a few ways to search, but if we wanted to search, if we had a if we had a graph and we want to go searching for something, so that's a popular question we're going to ask. Given a graph, can is something in it? So you might have like you know a whole bunch of people who are in your network or a group of friends on Facebook or something like that, and you want to search: is this friend in my tree and in my graph? We have to figure out some way to do this. So there's two very popular searching algorithms for graphs. One is called breadth-first search, and the other one is called depth-first search. So the breadth-first search algorithm, um, the breadth-first search algorithm is basically, the, al the general idea is you start at the root, you then look at all the children, and if you don't find what you're looking for, then look at all the grandchildren, and then the great-grandchildren, and so on. Um, and the depth-first search, which we'll cover shortly, is the one where you go, you pick one child and go all the way down, all those children, that whole path until you hit the bottom, then come back up to the top and do that for the next child. And then the way this algorithm is written, it does some side statistics that may help us solve different problems later. So it might, this might be a little bit of overkill, but some of this bookkeeping that's being done will help, might help us later on solve a different question. 
So the way it works is every the way this algorithm works is every vertex so that starts off of your search, no vertex has been touched yet. And this algorithm, this is from the uh, Comar's book. So this algorithm um, paints every vertex initially white, meaning it's never been looked at yet. If you visit a vertex but you're not done with it, this is going to be true for both the breadth first search and the depth first search. If you visit a vertex but you're not finished with it, it turns gray. And then when you're eventually finished with it, it turns black. And this, the, you'll see, this will this will be able, we'll be able to answer side questions based on the colors of vertex, vertexes along the way. So the way the breadth first search works is, first of all, we start off, we color every vertex white. We say it's distance from the root, so that already you can start to see we might be answering questions like how far away is one point from another point, which will help us in like doing GPS type problems. So we say the, uh, the distance that we are from the root for every node is initially infinity. And then we'll make it smaller and smaller as time goes on. And then um, the pi vector is who the parent is. So right now we just have a bunch of nodes. And from the point of view of the root, who's ever connected to the root is a child of the root. And then who's ever connected to that as a grandchild and so on. So this pi vector is actually uh, who, who your parent is. So right now, every node has no parent. Every node is infinitely far away from the root, and every node has not been visited yet. Then we pick one node that is the root, and they're using S as the source, and we make it gray. That means it's been visited, but it's still worth looking at again. We're not finished with it yet. We say its distance from the root is 0, and its parent is nobody. So the root has no parent. That's the first thing that has no parent. And then what we do is we put S into a set, and we say while this set, now here's, here's what you want to think about. What data structure would you put this in? But right now we're putting S into a set, and then we're saying while there's something in the set, grab what's ever at the, the head of the queue. Well, I'm almost giving away what data structure would be a good one to use. But we're going to pick something from the set and then say for everything adjacent to that, which is all its children, right? Any, any vertex has a list of what's adjacent to it. That would be all its children. Anything that's adjacent to it, if its color is white, meaning we haven't visited yet, turn it gray. And then say its distance from the root is one higher than its parent. So if your parent is one away from the root, then you're two away from the root. If your parent is six away, then you're seven. And then, we, and then we record that the, par uh, the parent, the thing we're using, V, is, yeah, the, the uh, U is the child of the parent V. No, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, U is the thing we're picking out. We're picking out U. So v, v is all its children. The V's parent is U. So we're recording who the parents are, and how far away they are from the original uh, root. So this just keeps going on and on. And what we keep doing is, every time we, every time we pick out a vertex, we go and see, we go and grab all its children and put that into this set Q. <coughs> and then we go, we keep going through this set Q until it ends. So, for example, if the vertex, if you took the first vertex and it had three children, the first vertex would go into the set. Then we would grab its first child, but we'd have we'd have the three children of the of the root, and we're going to use a linked list. It's going to end up being the sensible um, data structure for Q. So we put the three children in a linked list. Then we take the first child and put all its children on the end of the linked list. So it's kind of like the first three links are the children. Then we start linking the grandchildren onto the end of the list. And we just keep walking through the list, linking on more grandchildren and great-grandchildren until we get to the end of the list. And then that way we'll be able to see, we'll eventually visit every vertex and we'll have a bookkeeping way that we don't, we're not in a cycle and we just keep visiting the same one over and over.
Does that does that make sense? Let me maybe I'll just go over an example on the board. Um, so so it would be something like this. If we had if we had a node S, but let's say the source, and then we had A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and H. What we're basically trying to do is we're doing a search, which means we want to visit every node and have because we're looking for something. And we don't want to, if we happen to get into a, uh, if there was a cycle in our graph, we don't want to go from S to A to E to F to B to S to A and just keep searching forever. We want to somehow know, oh, I've, been, I've seen this one before. So what we're basically doing is we're building a linked list and we're putting S on the linked list. So this would end up being the set Q. What the algorithm is calling the set Q, we're going to implement as a linked list. Then we're going to say, okay, what is adjacent to S that is still on this algorithm white, meaning hasn't been visited yet? So that would be A, B, and C. So we would add A, B, and C. And then it has no more children. So now what we do, that means we're done with S. And at that point, that's the last line of the algorithm. S would then turn black, meaning it's no, we've already looked at it and it won't give us more things to look at. Now we look at A. What is A connected to? A is connected to S, D, and E. But at this point, S would be, the only ones that are still not visited yet would be D and E. So the line that says, if the, if the color is white, turn it gray. Oh, so what, what the other thing is this. A, A would be, would have, would be a distance of one from the root and its parent would be S. B would be one from the root, its parent would be S. C would be one from the root, its parent would be S. Now, when we go and visit A, A is adjacent to S, D, and E. But we would only pick up D and E as new nodes. So D's parent would be A, and it would be considered two, two hops away from the root. However, however, whoever your parent is will record who your parent is, and however far away your parent is from the root, we'll add one more. And then E's parent would be A, and it would be two hops away. Then this would turn gray, and this would turn gray. And we're done with A. Now we go to B. So wait, now we're, now we're done with A. And at the front of, we pop the front of the list up and now B has the child, B is connected to S, A, I'm sorry, just S and F. But S is black by now, and this one is white, which means we can add it to the list. So what we're really doing is we're adding all the children we haven't visited yet to the end of the linked list. And the, the point of this is so we don't we don't go into a loop and just start visiting everybody over. Where is the start? We've erased the start of the linked list or something on Yeah, the, the, the yeah. so this this set queue, which we can implement using many data structures, but it looks like a linked list would be the best one. We throw one thing in and we keep we add all its children onto the end and then get rid of it. Then go to the next one, add its children onto the end, get rid of it. So add its children. So when it's black, it's no longer a part of the list, it's gone. Yeah. So, yeah, actually, yeah. So basically, the ones uh, in the breadth of our search case, the ones, as soon as, as soon as we load all its children on, we don't need it anymore, right? It'll never come. And what do these things go gray then? Gray means... Uh, so, yeah, it yeah, means we visited. Yeah. Gray always means we visited, but we're not done with it. And for instance, if we have oh. a, a would be gray, 
once we did D, but we haven't done E yet. Right, so if, if for example, A and B were linked together, A, B, and C would go gray as soon as they were put on the list. A would be then connected to B, so we wouldn't add B as a, as a child, meaning we have to search it again because we already searched it. But we want to keep B alive because we haven't loaded B's children on yet. Right, that's why it had to go gray. It had to go three states. It had, to, it had to go from not visited to visited, but we still want to get more information out of it, and then we're completely done with it. So that, that, was, the state, that was the three states. <clears throat> so what we're really doing with the breadth for our search is, but, and now breadth means like, from this point, just hit everything you can hit from it, and then before you start getting rid of this layer, make sure you loaded its children on before you get rid of that, you know, and that way we make sure we visit everything. And we're also keeping some statistics along the way. How far you are away from the root, someone may be interested in that, and plus who's your parent. We're kind of saying like, even though there is no concept of parents here, D is the child of A and A is the child of S. So from the point of view of S looking down, we have the, the who's the child of who. So that's what this algorithm's doing. And and so this is this is the code for it. And yeah, so basically, just going over this one one time quickly. Um, every vertex is every vertex is initialized to white. Its distance from the root is infinity, and nobody has any parents. We pick up the root and make it gray, meaning we visited it, but we still have the use to do more. S is zero away from itself and has no parent. Now we take S and throw it into this linked list data structure. Now we pick out the head of the linked list data structure, which is, at the first time, is just S. Everything that is adjacent to S gets loaded on to, uh, if it's not been visited yet, we mark it visited. We say its distance from the root is one higher than what we currently are at, record its parents, and then put it onto, take everything that is adjacent to it and put that onto the end of the queue, at the end of the linked list. And then when we're done with it, that one pops off and we're done with it, and we mark it done. So, this is an algorithm that just basically, with its bookkeeping, makes sure we visit every node and don't get caught into a cycle where we keep visiting the same nodes over and over. So the goal is to, to take a graph and visit each edge once, looking for stuff, and somehow make sure we don't keep repeatedly looking at the same edge. So what's the running time of this algorithm? So, so far in this course, we've always done running time based on n, the number of inputs. Now, graphs can have, graphs have one as inputs. It has the number of vertices plus the number of edges. And we could actually, using some graph theory, we could say stuff like, the, what's, for example, what's the number of, the maximum number of edges you could have if your graph has V vertices? So if you have three vertices, what's the most number of edges you could have? Three, right? You can make triangle. a triangle. Now, if you had four vertices, and again, this, these are questions that are kind of graph theory questions, but if you had four vertices, what's the maximum number of edges you could have? If everybody's connected to everybody, you'd have, you'd have a box with an X in the middle. Two, three, four, five, six. So then every time you add a new vertex, you're adding, if you, you know, if you had V vertex, vertices and then added one more, you'd have V more edges. So there, I mean, there is a capacity. It ends up being, I think it ends up being V times V minus one, something like that. But, but there, is a, there is a max to it. But what we're going to do for graph algorithms, we're going to measure the algorithms, not by the number of inputs N, but by V N E. So if you have an algorithm that does something for every vertex, like let's say sorts all the vert vertices or sorts all the edges. That algorithm, let's say you're running a quick sort, sorting a bunch of edges, that will say that'll have a running time of 
E log E as opposed to N log N. Right? Like remember we said merge sort had a running time of N log N. If you had N numbers and you merge sorted them, it was N log N. Well now if you have E edges and you for some reason decide to sort them, that'll take E log E. So E is the number of edges and B is the number of vertices. We could also have graphs where let's say you had 10,000 vertices and no edges. It's a disconnected graph. So you could have a very high number of um, vertices and a very low number of edges. So we'll do our algorithm analysis in the input is V and E. So the first step where we initialized everything to uh, you know all those distances and all the vertices were not touched yet and their distances were infinity, that part took order V. We had to do it once for every vertex. Then the total number of operations on the queue is V. So as we, when I'm calling the queue or that link list, every time we threw something in, we had to pop something off and then grab all its children. Pop the next one off, grab all its children. So that operation happens V time. And then the adjacent, now here's where if we use an adjacency list as opposed to an adjacency matrix, the adjacency list for each vertex is scanned once. Every time we visit a vertex and start adding its children onto the end, we, we only do that once for every vertex. That whole changing the color white to gray was a bookkeeping thing to make sure we didn't keep loading the same children onto the end of the list. So that scan is done once, and since the sum of the lengths of all the edges, all the adjacency list is E, then this happens a total at most E times. Now does that make sense? If we chose to represent the graph using a matrix, the, the rectangular matrix instead of a linked list, then how much work would have been involved loading all the children onto the end of the list? We would actually have to, we'd have to visit every vertex once and then we'd have to check every vertex to see if it's a child or not. If it was zeros and ones, we'd have to go through every one, whether it's a child or not, and then load them onto the end of <coughs> the list. Does that part make sense? Because the, the, this is like a, a difference. It would actually make the algorithm run a little bit worse if we chose to represent the graph using an adjacency matrix. That's where I have a bunch of zeros and ones. Well, one means they're connected, zero means they're not. So at the point where we decide, I now have a vertex, I want to load its children onto the end of the linked list. Who are its children? One way we can just hop through the linked list of its children and we're done. The other one we have to check the entire row to see if it's a zero or a one. And that amount of time is V time. We have to check every vertex to see if it's connected to the one we're currently looking at. So, for example, an exaggerated example would be, suppose you had a thousand vertices, but a vertex only had two children. If you represented it as a matrix, you have to look in a thousand places to figure out who the two children are. But if it was a linked list, you just do two operations and you're done. So, if we represented the, if the underlying data structure for the graph was a linked list, then this step, this step would be done E times, the total number of times to load all the children on would be one for every edge, as opposed to E squared, if we represented it as a adjacency matrix. So the overall running time of this algorithm is V plus E. We have to initialize all the vertices to a distance of, you know, all that initializing bookkeeping stuff. And then for every vertex, we have to go and we have to load its children onto the end of the linked list, and we have to do that until we walk through the whole linked list. And that's the length of that linked list will be one, for every edge, there'll be a link on that linked list. So the running time of this algorithm is V plus E. So if you have an algorithm graph that had 10,000 vertices and one edge, you still have to initialize all the edges to, you know, a distance of the parents are, with the parents are that initial loop would still have to run and then you'd handle the one edge and the algorithm's done. So it would still take, it would take like, you know, a million plus one step. And then if the graph was the other extreme where you have a certain set of vertices and tons and tons of edges connecting them together, 
the part where we keep going through all its children and putting them on the link list, that is still going to take E steps. Okay, and then like, so what are some side questions we could use breadth first search to answer? So given a graph where all the edges are of length one, oh, that's another thing. We could also, for our, the edges, the graphs that we had at the beginning, their edges could have a value to them. So like a distance, you know, just like on a map. You could say this edge, from this edge to this edge, the distance is 10, but this one, the distance is two. But if we had a graph that had all the edges are of length one, and I asked, what is the distance from S to all the other vertices in the graph? The version of Death First Search, where we were doing that bookkeeping, how far are you away from your parent, we were, we were keeping track of that. So that version would actually answer this as a side question. Another side question we could answer, oh no, actually, I think I bring that up at the end of the slide. But So that's one way to handle searching. And again, what we're trying to do is basically make sure we visit every node in the tree and then don't keep visiting the same node over and over. That would be, you know, we want to make sure we don't get, if our graph has a loop, we don't want to get stuck visiting the graphs over and over. The other, the other extreme version of a search would be the one where you go to visit, you pick, you pick some node as the root, you visit its first child, and then go visit its grandchild and great-grandchild and so on. Go almost down to the bottom of the tree, and when you hit the bottom, then start working your way back up. And again, just keeping some kind of bookkeeping to make sure you don't visit the same nodes over and over. So this algorithm does, now that, so, yeah, let me go over um, an example on the board. So this would be, just to get a little feel for the way this algorithm would work, um, the depth first search algorithm would go, we would, let's say again we were starting at this node was the root. Breath first search says we would visit A, B, and C, then go D, E, F, G, and H. Depth first search will visit the child, the, the leftmost child um, of the node we're currently looking at, then go to its leftmost child, and then keep trying to go to its leftmost child until there are no more leftmost child. Once we visit this one, if this doesn't have any more children or what it's connected to, then we go back to the parent and say, are there more children to go through? So we would go in this order. It would be one, two, three. We would bounce back to the parent, then go to its child, four. The way I connected this here, this would become, F would be a child of E, and B would become a child of F, and then B would have S as something that's connected to, but that's now changed that would be uh, gray at the moment, so we wouldn't visit it. And then we'd stop. Then we'd bounce back to the parent, and each time we go back to the parent, we're looking to see, are there more children we haven't visited? And if not, we bounce back to the parent, we bounce back to here. And these would now get all marked as completed. We'd bounce back to here, and then this would go to the next child. This would be uh, the seventh one we hit, then the leftmost child would be eight. We look for more children, there's none. We bounce back to the parent looking for more children. This would be the ninth one. This has no more children that haven't been visited. We bounce back to here, no more children bounce back to here, and we're finally done. And the other thing this algorithm does is it keeps bookkeeping on, uh, and this is again for answering side questions, of what time it was when we visited each node and what time it was when we were done with it. So the, another bookkeeping thing that I'll show up is we visit this one at time one, visit this one at time two, visit this one at time three, then this one was done, right? Didn't have any more children to add, so at time four we were done with it. We bounce back to the parent, we're not done with this one, we went here. At time four, four you were done, you visited at time three, it, the relationship between the three and the four, we're saying 
it's one more to be done. It takes you time one to. Well, no, I, what, I'm, what I'm saying is one thing we'll see in this example, we're time stamping right. um, like as if we were running a clock okay. that started at one and every time we used the time stamp, we went to the next number. We time stamp when we first visit the node, which would be when it turns gray. Oh, actually, you know what, now that I think of it, we time stamp when it turns gray and we time stamp when it turns black. So we would go when we first visited, and then when we were completely done with it, and those timestamps can be used to answer other questions too. So these algorithms, that they're, they're going over more material than just the depth first search needs, but it's doing this side stuff to answer questions we'll, we'll sh do shortly after this. Okay, so that's what this algorithm is doing. It's basically same initialization as before, and then the, what's new is when we go to visit a node, now this is going to be a recursive con um, function, when we go to visit a node, we mark it gray, we, we add one to the timestamp, and then timestamp um, when we visited the node, then for every node adjacent to it, if it hasn't been visited yet, we visit it again. We call it. So this is actually recursively calling itself on every child it has. The first child that finds, and I kind of said on the blackboard from left to right, but it's really, it's in a, an adjacency list. It's just the first one it grabs. So there's really no concept of left to right. Left to right is when we're drawing it on a board, but we're just grabbing the first, um, we're grabbing in its adjacency list, we grab the first one and then call depth first search on it again. So it's, it keeps recalling itself recursively until it can't, until it has no more children to call itself on. And we're also keeping the timestamp of when we're finished. So that'll help us solve a question in uh, the next class. But, so that's what this algorithm is doing. And then the running time of this algorithm is, oh, I'm sorry, this is one example. So this is basically, um, what we're saying is, if this was our graph, and we happen to arbitrarily pick node u as our starting point, we would stamp u as it was first visited at time 1, then we visited v, stamped that as time 2, then we visited y, stamped that as time 3, the only thing it can connect to, because this is a directed graph, is x, stamped that at time 4, x has no more children to add to the search. So we stamp, we give a second stamp saying we're now done with x at time 5. And then we went back to y, which had no more children to offer. We stamped that we're done at time 6. Then we went to here, we were done at time 7. We bounced back to here, this had no more children to offer. We were done at time 8. And still we haven't even started these two. So now uh, the depth first search will randomly pick one of the ones that hasn't been visited yet and start running a depth first search on that. So in this case, we started with this one. It had this as a child, so this is time 9, time 10. This is now finished, so it was done at time 11, and then this one was done at time 12. So that timestamp will actually have a, a usefulness. Right now, these timestamps don't mean anything as far as searching. We could have searched this graph without the timestamp. Right? right, all we're doing, when we're searching, we're just picking and saying, for every child you have, I'm going to re recall depth first search on that child. So depth first search says grab any child and call itself. Grab the child, calls itself. Grab the child, calls itself. Has no more children, bounce back to the previous call and continue grabbing the next child and call yourself. Okay, so that's, and then this time stamping is just used to answer side problems. It'll come a little bit later. Okay, so the analysis for this algorithm is the depth first search visit, which is the thing we keep recursively calling ourselves, we call it once for every vertex in the graph, right? Because every time we go to call it, we first check, is the thing we're calling it on something that's never been visited yet? So the, the recursive function gets called exactly v time. During each um, call to it, the inner loop, where we gather up all the children, that runs, that part in the middle is going to run e times. That, that, how many, how many um, 
vertices are adjacent to it is proportional to how many edges are in the graph. <coughs> right? So, so the, then the question is, we have a function that's running v time, v times, the total amount of work of all the of all the v calls, the total amount of work of all of them added up would be proportional to e. So this kind of goes back to that amortized cost thing we were saying. If if you call a function, if you call a function v times, and the amount of work it does is proportional to e, but if you added up all the v calls, the total amount of work is just one e. Then the total of that inner loop is E for the whole algorithm. Even though it could look like, does it seem like it might be V times E? Anyone? That if you made a, if you called a function V times, and each time you called it, it did an amount of work for however many edges are adjacent to the vertex you're calling it on, it looks like it might be V times E, the total work for the whole algorithm. But if you add it up all of those linked lists for every vertex, it would be the length of E, not, not E squared. I'm, I'm sorry, not V times E. The total amount of work would just be E. Okay, and then one like just side question for now. If you were given a binary tree, print out all its elements in the in order. So did that come up in your, your uh, discrete math class, what in order and pre order and post order is? for an equation. So like for example, A plus B. Prefix notation. And yeah, prefix notation, notation would be like plus A and B, plus A and B would be pre-order? Pre pre prefix notation? Okay, but if you wanted to print out something in its correct order, the algorithm that you would use would be a an altered version of depth first search because depth first search visits a child then visits all its children and when you bounce, if it was a binary tree, what you would do is that you would print out, you would go until you hit the bottom of the tree, print that out, then when you bounce back up to a parent that's still gray, you would print that one out and go to its next child. This would be a case where they only have two children and then print out its right child. And then you'd bounce back to that parent, at that point it gets marked black and you don't have to print it again, you've already printed it. So there's, there's these algorithms, even though they're searching algorithms, they can also answer some side questions. And then um, another, just a side topic, would be if you took a random graph, a random tree, and ran depth first search on it, just not that you're searching for anything, but just you decided to run depth first search on it, and let's say you started with A. A would have a child B, and then we call that for a search visit, which has a child E, which has a child D, and then D doesn't have any children not visited, we would bounce back to the parent and look for more stuff to visit, and that would be F. And then F would bounce back, uh, I'm sorry, F would have C, and then C has a child B. So in our algorithm, we would look for what's adjacent to C, and B would be adjacent to it, but at this point it was gray, so we skipped it. But we could decide if we wanted to draw a graph with what they call a back edge, an edge from C back to B, and then we would be done with C, we'd bounce back to F, we go to E. E has a gray child, A. That means that we've already visited it, but we could draw a graph, back, uh, an edge back to uh, from E back to A. So if we wanted to take this graph, which is undirected, run depth first search. So the depth first search, the corresponding depth first search tree, usually starts with a root node and starts working its way downward. Then it could have side nodes and those can work the way downward. And then any time there's a loop, we um, draw an edge back. This, so you could kind of see we could create this graph from that graph by running depth first search. This graph can then be used. This is now a directed graph built on an undirected graph. This could be used to answer questions like um, how many cycles are in the graph and you know, can, like this, this cycle here and 
this cycle here overlaps, so if the cycles are overlapping, you might be able to find quicker paths to connect things together. And how, how, how much the graph has overlapping cycles in it? It could answer side questions like that. So, oh yeah, so then here's, here's a kind of a question. If you were asked the question, um, given a graph, uh, is there a cycle in the graph, yes or no? This is actually a popular operating systems question. I don't know if, you're, if you guys have taken operating systems yet, but an operating system has processes and resources and wants to know if there's a deadlock. Is, is one program holding a file and waiting for another file and the other program's holding a file and waiting for the first one and they're stuck waiting for each other to finish and they'll never finish? You can cr the operating system creates a graph and then it asks itself, is there a, well actually the, the operating system is maintaining a graph at all times, but every once in a while it has to ask itself, is there a cycle? And if so, then it knows there's processes that are deadlocked. But if you had a graph and you were asked the question, does this graph contain a cycle or not? A yes or no question, how can you solve it? Actually, either one of these algorithms, breadth first search or depth first search, would work. Right? Because you run either one of the algorithms, and if you ever hit a gray vertex, that means you're bouncing around from vertex to vertex, and you've reached one that you've been to before. So there must have been a cycle. And then the question is, now both of these algorithms have a running time of V plus E, which is really saying out of V and E, whichever one is bigger than the other, that's the running time of the algorithm. But in this case, we can actually make the argument, the overall running algorithm, this will be now a modified depth first search or breadth first search, where basically the, you, run, you write the code that says run, let's say breadth first search, if you visit a gray node, stop, and answer yes. If you don't visit, a, until you visit a gray, well, if you hit the end of the graph and there were no gray nodes, then the graph was a tree. There was no cycling. So if the answer is no, you would have to search the whole graph, but in order for the graph to be a tree, the number of edges had to be equal to the number of vertices minus one. That's by definition a tree. The number of vertices is one more than the number of edges. That, that way you could never create a cycle. So the running time of that would be V plus E, but V would be one more than E, so we could just kind of say it's V. And if we ever answered yes, that means we probably even haven't searched the whole graph. We've searched part of it and then just hit a yes, but the number of hops we have searched could never be more than the number of vertices. So in the worst case, it would never be more than E. So really, the one thing about these, these two algorithms that have a running time where it says the running time is V plus E, and this is something that I'll, this, this is something that is, um, so let me just go back to that. Um, what was it, the running time? See, this one thing about the notation. You know how, this is something just to get used to. You know how when we say an algorithm runs N squared? We would never say n squared plus n because n squared dominates n. So we would just say n squared. In this case, whenever we say the running time is something plus something, it's almost like we're saying or. We're saying like whichever one is worse. We're like covering that case. Like we're, we're almost saying like it's v or e whichever one is bigger. And because we, our algorithm needs to handle every graph, we don't know which one's going to be bigger. We get up the case where E is V times V minus 1. That's where like all the edges are, you know, all the vertices are all connected to each other. And then we get up the other extreme where V is really high and there could actually be no, no edges. We get, a graph can actually be a bunch of dots with no edges, technically, right? So this is really, when you say the running time is V plus E, you're really saying the running time is V or E, whichever one is the worst one. So that's just a strange thing to get used to.